Let G be a group with subgroups H and K inside of G. Uh, and let's suppose that the product, the Frobenius product of H times K is equal to the whole, whole group G. Uh, further, let's suppose that the intersection of H and K is trivial. That is the only thing that's common to both H and K is the identity. And let's further suppose that every element of H commutes with every element of K. So if you take something in H and you times it by something in K, that's the same thing as times it by those same elements in K and H right there. Now, I'm not claiming that H is commutative or that K is abelian, right? I'm not saying that H commutes with anything in H or K anything with K. I'm just saying they, com they, commute, uh, they commute with each other. Or oftentimes we, realize, we say this statement right here that's now underlined. We say that they centralize. They centralize each other. So G is the product of two subgroups which intersect trivially and centralize each other. In this situation, we say that G is an internal direct product of H and K, which is kind of a curious thing. It's like internal direct product. What does that mean, right? We've learned about direct products before for which H and K could be any two groups under the sun, and we can build a new group uh, by taking all the possible ordered pairs of H and K as these range over the elements of the two groups. Uh, so this is what's commonly referred to as the external direct product. In turn, the, the internal direct product we see here is that you already have a group in hand. We didn't build a group. It's already built. But looking inside of the group, we can find subgroups, which in some essence will act like it was a direct product. And we'll be very specific about that in just a second. But let's look at some examples of what's going on here. So let's take the group G to be Z8 star. So Z8 star will be the, the multiplicative group mod 8. We take those integers, which are co-prime to 8 and we work with them multiplicatively. So two possible subgroups we could consider. You take H, if it's a cyclic subgroup generated by three, well, three times three is nine, which is one mod eight. And so therefore the cyclic subgroup generated by three is just cyclic of order two, one and three. The same thing happens when you take the cyclic subgroup generated by five. Five times five is 25, which is 24 plus one. Uh, so tw five will be order two mod eight. So we have this right here. So notice if you take H and K, these are both cyclic subgroups, so they're subgroups. If you take their intersection, the intersection is gonna be one, right? The only thing that's common to both is the identity there. So we have that. And then what does their product look like? If you take H times K, you'll remember from a previous video that the cardinality of the set H times K, this will always equal the order of H times the order of K divided by the order of their intersection, for which we then see that H has order two, K has order two, their intersection has order one. So you get two times two divided by one, which is four. So we have a subset HK living inside of G. Well, G has order four and HK itself is a set of size four. So this forces equality, right? Since G is order four right here, that means that HK has to equal G. This is a very common trick that if the size of this Frobenius product is equal to this order of the group, then it has to be the whole group. So HK is equal to G. So boom, we have that. Their intersection is trivial. And in this case, um, G is an abelian group. So everything commutes with each other. So in particular, the subgroups will centralize each other. Uh, so this shows that in fact, whoops, we need that check mark there. That shows that G is in fact the eternal direct product of three and five. Now I do wanna make a comparison here before we go on, right? This group, Z8 star, this is none other than, I mean, the Klein four group, this is isomorphic to Z4, which is just Z2 cross Z2, which notice here, H is this a cyclic group of order two, K is a cyclic group of order two. And now we're saying that G is, a, is an internal direct product of uh, two, two cyclic groups of order two. That's not a coincidence. We'll see before the end of this video that that's actually to be expected. Uh, let's do another example uh, before that though. This time let's take the group G or D6, so the dihedral group of order 12, the symmetries of a regular hexagon. Um, let's take as our first subgroup H, the cyclic subgroup generated by R3. This is likewise a subgroup of order two. R3 is gonna be the 180 degree rotation. 
okay? Let's take as K the subgroup generated by R squared and S. This will contain six elements. It contains one R squared R to the fourth S, R squared S, and R four S. This group right here is actually just the dihedral group D3, right? Because uh, if we're working in D6, a single rotation right here would be 30 degrees for which a, uh, I said that wrong, I'm sorry, it would be 60 degrees, would be a single rotation, right? And so then a double rotation would be 120 degrees. So if we just do um, the element squared, you're going to get 120, 240, and 360. This is just the rotational symmetries of a regular triangle, the equilateral triangle, right? Same thing with the reflections. So this group right here, K, is just D3 inside of D6, or that's also isomorphic to S3, the symmetric group on three letters right there. So in particular, when you look at the intersection, the only thing that's common to both is the identity, right? R3 is not inside this set. So their, their, pro, their intersection is trivial. In terms of their product, right, H times K, well, H has order two, K has order six, and their intersections one. So two times six divided by one is 12. That is the order of the dihedral group, right? D6, its order is equal to two times six, which is 12. So again, by counting argument, K, HK is equal to the whole group. Well, do they centralize each other, right? Well, if you look at the element of H, there's only two elements there, right? You have the identity. The identity will commute with everything because whether you have one times the identity or the excuse me, one times the permutation pi or pi times one, right? It's always just equal to pi there. So the identity centralizes everything, right? It commutes with everything. What about R3, for example? Well, this one we might have to consider using normal forms. So if you take R3 and you times it by a permutation pi, well, let's say pi is a rotation. Well, R3 times pi will then be R3 times RK, for which as an exponent, that's R to the three plus K, but the exponents commute. We get RK, R3. So yeah, rotations commute with rotations, so R3 would commute with any rotation. Uh, but in terms of reflections, right, the typical reflections in D6 will look like RKS. So if you take R3 times pi, you get R3, RKS. Well, like we saw before, RK will commute with R3. And then in terms of S here, commuting S with R3, there's a toll that has to be paid. You have to take the inverse of R to pass it by S. But as we're working mod six, negative three and positive three are actually the same thing. So you get R3 again. And so it does in fact commute. Um, so recall that the center of a group, right? This is the set of all elements Z, all elements Z inside of G, such that ZG is equal to GZ for all G inside G. So the center of the group is the set of all elements which commute with everything, okay? Um, and so, this it turns out to be a subgroup, right? It turns out to be a normal subgroup, something we'll define a little bit later. Uh, but what we see, what you can see here is that the center of D6 is actually equal to this set H that we've introduced. And so in particular, H and K centralize each other since H is the center, it centralizes everything. And so we got all the conditions. Uh, let's see, intersection of H and K is trivial. Their product is the whole group and they centralize each other. So again, D6 is the internal direct product of its center with D3. Let's look at one more example of this, of this uh, internal direct product. This time, let's take S3. We're gonna take H to be the cyclic subgroup generated by one, two, three. So this is actually the alternating group A3, which contains the identity one, two, three, and one, three, two. Uh, let's take the subgroup K, which is just a cyclic subgroup generated by one, two, uh, so it'll contain one and the transposition, one, two, like so. When you take their product, a simple counting argument gives you this again, right? So the size of HK, this is going to equal three times two divided by, well, their intersection is going to be one, right? The only thing common to both. So this gives you six, which is three factorial, which is the size of S3 right here. But... Notice that these subgroups do not actually centralize each other. So we have, we have a, their product is the whole group, their intersection is trivial, but these things don't actually centralize with each other. Uh, notice what happens, right? When, when you take one, two, three times one, two, that's gonna equal one, three, right? So one goes to two, two goes to three, and then three goes back to one, two will be fixed, so that product's true. 
On the other hand, if you take 1, 2 times 1, 2, 3, right? 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1, so 1 is fixed. 2 goes to 3, and then 3 goes back to 2. So these two products are not, they don't commute with each other. So H and K do not centralize one another. So S3 is not an internal direct product of H and K. It's close. Uh, it's really close. In this situation, this is what one actually would call an internal semi-direct product. Uh, but that's a topic for another lecture. I don't want to get into that any anymore here. So let's let's actually explain why we call this structure the internal direct product. So suppose G is an internal direct product of subgroups H and K. So remember our axioms here that G is equal to H times K. We have that H intersect K is trivial and we have that they centralize each other. Centralize each other. I should come up with some shorthand for something like that. So if they centralize each other, then in that situation, then we can prove that G is actually isomorphic to H cross K, which this right here, H cross K, this is referred to as the external direct product, as we mentioned at the beginning of this video, because H and K are, are genuine subgroups of G, right? They're inside of G, hence the internal right here, as opposed to H and K might not have anything to do with each other in general. When you take the direct product, you form G. So from externally, we build G, or internally, can we factor G? These two notions really are the same thing uh, because up to isomorphism, they're the same thing. And for a group theorists, we don't distinguish between things that are isomorphic. So since G is an internal direct product, we have our assumption that G equals H times K. Kachink, that's the first one right there. And as such, we're going to then define a function from h cross k to h, or to h k by the following rule. Phi of h k is equal to h k. Now, I want you to be aware that this is the same function we used in the proof of theorem 9216 in this lecture series. It actually was just the previous video of this lecture series right here. And so some things we proved about that, that function is that, first of all, it's a well-defined surjective function. Uh, that's important to know. Um, also, be by, by the assumption h or g equals h k, notice this is actually a function from h cross k to g. It's a surjective function. But we also mentioned in the previous video that this function right here, that every preimage, every preimage of an element, phi inverse of h k, right? This thing has as its set size uh, the intersection of H and K. Basically, two things will map to the same element in a one-to-one -one correspondence to elements of H, K. And so we made the statement that this map will be injective if and only if H intersect K is trivial. But kachink, that's the assumption we have right here. So based upon the results of that previous theorem, uh, we have that this map phi is in fact a bijection. Well, that's a pretty good direction to go for an isomorphism. So we have that the map phi from H cross K to G, so far it's a bijection. To show it's an isomorphism, we need to have the homomorphic property. So let's consider that. Which again, I want you to be aware that this is, this is gonna be a very simple argument here. Let's take two arbitrary elements of H cross K. So take two elements of H, we'll call them little h and H prime, and take two elements of K, we'll call them little k and K prime. Um, and so therefore, if we were to, if we were to take phi of H K times H prime K prime, so this is the product of two arbitrary elements in H K, this is going to equal this element right here, because again, just, you just component wise multiplication, multiply together H and H prime and multiply together K and K prime. So we get here, but then by the, the map phi, this will become h phi, h prime times k k prime, and by reassociativity, you know this is a group after all. We can do the parentheses like this, and so this gets us to our last condi condition, kachinka, right? We they centralize each other, so h and k commute with one another. So h prime k is equal to k h prime, right? For which then, if you reassociate, you're going to get h k h prime k prime. For which the first one will be phi of h k, the second one will be phi of h 
prime, k prime. And so that then proves the homomorphic property. So we do in fact have an isomorphism between G and H cross K. So if you have an internal direct product, that means your group is actually isomorphic to this external direct product uh, that I've mentioned a couple times. So an example of this, uh, if you take, for example, the group Z6, you can argue that Z6 is isomorphic to Z2 cross Z3, uh, where basically your generator is going to be the element 1 comma 1 because the G, uh, the GCD of 2 and 3 is, excuse me, the, the LCM of 2 and 3 is 6. So this will give us a cyclic group of order 6. So it's got to be isomorphic to Z6 because all cyclic groups are isomorphic if they have the same order. Now, if this is, this is right here in an external direct product, right? We think of Z6. So if we were to elaborate here, what is Z2 cross Z3 here? We think of it as the six elements, you get 0, 0, 1, 0, uh, 0, 1, we're going to get 1, 1. Uh, who have we forgotten here? We're going to get 1, 2. Feels like I'm going through this randomly. 0, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So there's six elements right there. On the other hand, Z6, we really think of it as like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And so these groups are isomorphic. We've established that, though. And so since C6 is, is isomorphic to the external direct product of Z2 cross Z3, then there should be subgroups of Z6, one of which looks like Z2 up to isomorphism. One of them looks like Z3 up to isomorphism. And it should be then, Z6 should be then a product of all these things. So our candidates are going to be the following. Take the cyclic subgroup generated by 3 inside of Z6 and take the cyclic subgroup generated by 2 inside of Z6. Well, H here will contain two elements, 0 and 3. Notice 3 plus 3 is 6. So this is going to be isomorphic to Z2. Uh, the, the subgroup generated by 2, on the other hand, this will contain 0, 2, and 4, right? 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 plus 4 is 6, which is 0. And this is isomorphic to Z3. So we have our candidates here, H and K. Um, their intersection, of course, is the identity, right? So it's just, it's just 0 is what's common to both of those things. Um, and it's an abelian group, so they will commute with each other. And then their product, right, if you take H. In this situation, since Z6 is an additive group, you probably would, instead of writing H times K, you'd write it as H plus K. Uh, but notice what goes on right here. You're going to get the order of H is 2. The order of K is 3. And divided by the intersection, which is 1. This is going to use 6, which is the order of Z6 right here. So we do, in fact, see that Z6 is the product of H and K. Um, and it's an internal direct product. And so this is what the previous theorem was showing us here, that internal and external direct products are, in fact, one and the same thing. We can find the factor groups inside of the group up to isomorphism here.